Well, the passage that we have before us this morning is a call to war. Or maybe not a call to war, but rather it's a wake-up call that there's already a war going on and we are in the middle of it. And because we're in the thick of it, we Christians are called to be active participants in it. I'll take it even further. In this war, not only are we to be active in it, but we are called by Scripture to be a savage, fighting, destructive people in this war. There is a war going on, but it may not be the war that you're thinking of. For instance, are we in the middle of a cultural war? Yes. Right? There is a, a clash of values and systems that is being waged right now through things like music and movies and social media, and there are battles taking place in schools and in homes and in offices, and both sides of this cultural war are fighting for what they believe to be good and right and acceptable issues of lifestyle and freedom and education and sexuality and race and economics and everything in between. There is a cultural war. But that's not the war that I'm talking about. Or is there a war going on right now for the soul of America? Yes. Americans right now are fighting over whether we will be people of truth, who recognize and celebrate reality, or we will be people of lies, who celebrate deception and falsehood. Or whether we will be a people that protect life, or we will be a people that protect murderers or whether we will be a people who protect freedom or a people who fight for oppression and tyranny. There is a war going on right now for the soul of America, but that's not the war that I'm talking about. The war I'm talking about is one that is actively taking place inside and for the church. And it's not a war that suddenly sprang up under the current administration. It's not a, one that's a result of the sexual revolution from the 60s and 70s. It wasn't started with the Enlightenment or modernity or postmodernism. No, this is a war that began 2,000 years ago. And it's still going on. And it is the subject of our text this morning. So we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Slowly making our way through 2 Corinthians, we find ourselves this morning in chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I am away, I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh... We are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And, every, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. This section marks uh, a new section in the, the book of 2 Corinthians, and, and it's one that will take us all the way through the end of the letter. And much of it centers on these people who had come into the church at Corinth with new ideas. They had a different way of thinking, and they called themselves apostles, although they weren't affiliated with the actual apostles. In fact, they weren't even Christians at all. Maybe they thought they were, uh, but they were deceiving themselves. Maybe they knew they weren't, but they were actively trying to take advantage of the church. But either way, over the next few weeks, we'll see that they were wrong if they thought they were believers because they weren't believers at all. And so really this passage is laying the groundwork for what's coming. But in order to see why these people pose such a threat to the church, we need to do a very quick overview of who they were and what they believed. And, and some of it, even though Paul is describing real people from 2,000 years ago in Corinth, we're going to see some of it that may sound familiar to us today. First and most telling is that these people promoted a different gospel. We'll see this when we get to chapter 11 
that they taught a different Jesus, and they taught a different spirit, and therefore they had a different understanding of the gospel, a different version of Christianity, and their version went something like this. If you're good, if you're a good person, if you follow the law of Moses, then you will be rewarded in this life. If you're good and obey God, then there will be no suffering, and there will be no pain, there will be no affliction, And so people that taught this, they looked at the Apostle Paul and said, how can that guy be godly? I mean, look at the suffering that he's gone through. Look at the pain he's gone through. He's he's beaten up every town he, he goes into. How can that man be a godly man? And because of these false beliefs about the gospel, their approach to ministry was radically different. They placed all their importance on outward appearance. The message for the preacher, they argued, was secondary to how he looked. So the Apostle Paul, well, they made fun of him. Like, he looks so weak when he's in person. He's, he probably was scarred from his frequent beatings. Uh, he wasn't much to look at. He didn't speak well. I mean, we probably imagine in our heads, oh, the Apostle Paul was like the Billy Graham of his day, right? But is the, his opponents regularly said, that guy doesn't speak well. He didn't follow the rules of rhetoric. He didn't have a good, demanding, preaching voice. So how could a man like that advance the kingdom of God? And so these false teachers relied instead on things like pedigree and background. That was what was significant. And so what they would do is they would come into churches and they would have these letters of recommendation that supposedly came from important preachers. And they, when they came in, They looked like leaders. They had the right persona and the right personality. And and stylistically, they were easy to listen to. So easy to listen to, in fact, that they charged people for their preaching. And so they gave a new, more manageable Jesus. They taught a new, profitable spirit. A new, more acceptable gospel. One that celebrated the preachers more than Jesus. In other words, the Corinthian church had been infiltrated by worldly thinking. And the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 10, 11, 12, is calling the Corinthian church to destroy it. Every believer is in the ministry. That's been the theme of this entire letter. If you're a Christian, you're a minister. It doesn't mean you're a pastor. It doesn't mean you're an elder. It doesn't mean you're a missionary. But every Christian is a minister. That word literally means servant. You're a servant of Jesus. And so each week we've been looking at, uh, it's a ministry of affliction. It's a ministry of boasting. It's a ministry of all these different things. And today we see that we are in a ministry of war. And we are called to be a destructive people. And so with the rest of our time this morning, we're going to see ways that we are called to be destructive to worldly thinking when it tries to sneak its way into the church. And the first is this, embrace weakness. The best way to destroy worldly thinking in the church is to embrace weakness. Look again at verse 1. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ... I who am humble when face to face, but bold towards you when I'm away, I beg of you that when I'm present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. So when Paul says here in verse 1 that I who am humble when I'm face to face, but bold when I'm away, he's being sarcastic there. And we know that because you go down to verse 9, which Lord willing we'll look at next week. Um, This is what the opponents in Corinth accused him of. Oh, Paul, he writes his letters and he's an old big man writing and he's going to come and he's going to confront and do it. But when he's face to face, he's not that way. He's meek. Remember, these false teachers put so much in appearances that they called out Paul for being nothing special. He's physically weak. And so what these opponents said, that if Paul really was spiritual, he'd have a more demanding presence when he spoke to you. Oh, he talks a big game when he's far away, but when he's face to face, he's scared. He's meek. Now, Paul was meek, but that doesn't mean he was afraid to be bold. 
All the way back in chapter two, remember he talks about how he was with them previously and his visit was painful because he was calling out their sins and he was calling them to account. And he warns them here, if you church don't deal with these false teachers, I'll be bold again with you. In fact, he says in verse two that he's gonna show bold confidence in those who are teaching this demonic teaching, this false teaching. And he says, I'm gonna be bold with them. I hope I don't have to be bold with you for putting up with them. But he was meek. In other words, don't mistake Paul's humility for fear. His humility was an active humility that kept him from taking advantage of people like these false teachers were doing. It was his intentional humility that was keeping him from trying to get all the attention put on himself. And the reason for that is he wanted to be like Jesus. He says, I entreat you by the, mer- by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Jesus was not a pompous jerk who went around elevating himself to put others down. No, instead we see in scripture that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life up as a ransom for many. This is the same Jesus who taught, it is the meek who shall inherit the earth. It's the same Jesus who taught that anyone who wants to be great among you must learn to be a servant, and anyone who wants to be a leader should serve. Think about the prophecies about Jesus from Isaiah, chapter 53, right? Jesus, this this Messiah who would come and deliver his people, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him. He had no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we esteemed him not. You have Jesus. The son, he was truly God, the son of God, but he was physically weak. He was not impressive to look at. And he tells us he could have used all his divine power at his disposal and with just a word could have destroyed his opponents. He could have at any moment in his life called down legions of angels to come down and destroy his enemies, but he chose to lay those those powers aside and be weak. Now, I know some people don't like the idea of Jesus being weak, but that's what Scripture says. 2 Corinthians 13, 4, we'll get there in a few weeks or months, says Jesus was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. That means in his flesh, Jesus embraced the weakness of his humanity, and we are called to do the same. Practically, what does this look like? Well, the key for us is at the end of verse 2. Look again at the repetition of that word flesh and the phrases that are around it. He says, some suspect us of walking according to the flesh, for though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. There's a big difference between walking according to the flesh and walking in the flesh. Walking in the flesh means we embrace our weakness. And that doesn't just mean our physical bodies. If you ran the marathon yesterday, you may be feeling physically weak right now. That could be what it's talking about, but that's not all it's talking about. Our clothing game may be weak. Our media savvy may not be as strong as other successful Christians have. We may be weak on the cool scale, right? But God chose what is weak in the world to shame the wise. He chose what is weak to shame the strong. And so when the false teachers and the false teaching creeps into the church saying that we will never be successful as a church unless we get stronger preaching that meets people where they're at with short, you know, snippets of life application uh, snippets or, or we'll never really be a good growing church until we have a great TikTok presence or we'll never really grow unless we engage the younger generations or, or the thousand other ways that they tell us that the church is weak. They tell us the church needs to change or die. We remember in that moment that we are called to be weak. And it is in the weakness that Christ proves to be strong. We walk in the flesh. We embrace the weaknesses that we have. But we don't walk according to the flesh. That's what the enemy wants us to do. These false teachers creeping into the church want us to think like the rest of the world. They want us to walk like the rest of the world. 
And again, this isn't only talking about everyday life out there. This is talking about in the church. If the enemy can get us to be a worldly church, then we'll have the best music and the best platform and the best show and we'll entertain everybody all the way to hell. So embracing weakness here doesn't mean we simply roll over and let people do whatever they want. No, we, I've already said this passage is a call to war. But the first and best way to wage war is by remembering that we are weak and we are to embrace that weakness. And in the weakness of our flesh, we fight like heaven. And that's the second way we can destroy worldly thinking in the church. First is we embrace weakness and the second is we use the divine power that God has given us. Verse four. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power. When the enemy and, and false teachers come into the church with the powers of cool and educated and charisma and statistics and the right clothes and a Jesus like Christ who can make us popular and wealthy, we combat that. We fight against it, but we don't fight them by outcooling them. We don't fight them by having better advertisement. We don't fight them by having more charisma. We don't beat back the worldly influence by acting like the world. We don't fight fire with fire because we have God's power. Look at what this looks like. Flip over to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. Flip over to the right, just a few books. Ephesians chapter 6 says this. Ephesians chapter 6, finally, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Listen, we have truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation. We have the word of God, the same word of God that created the entire universe, that spoke it into existence. We have the same word that took on flesh and dwelt with us. The same word that gives life and light to all. The same word that conquered death itself. The same word that the Holy Spirit uses to convict of sin and shine the light of Christ. When, when a weak disciple uses the divine word to advance and build up the church, what hope does the enemy have? And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him, and that word above all earthly powers. We as a church must decide if we will be a divine institution or a worldly one? Will we have the spirit of the living God living among us, at work among us, or will we have the spirit of this age? Will we, we, will we be the body of Christ marching through the world in conquest, or will we be the body of death simply waiting for our time to go into the furnace? God has granted us divine power why? So that the church will be able to do what the church is called to do, which is to shine 
the life-giving light of Christ onto and into the dark and dying world, which is something that's not humanly possible. So he gave us his divine power to do it. Think about Ezekiel standing at the valley of dry bones. How will these bones come alive? Not by acting like the dry bones, but by speaking, by giving the word of God, by God's spirit. That's what makes the dead come alive. And so we embrace our weakness because it's only then that we can use his divine power. And when we have his divine power, what do we do with it? We go on a rampage. The third way we eradicate worldly thinking in the church, we destroy and we capture. Look at verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Paul is going to vent his specific grief with these people when you get down to chapter 11, Um, but he's going to say, these false teachers come in here with this false teaching and this false way of thinking, and you put up with it. You're, You're not supposed to put up with it. You're supposed to destroy it. And so when it comes to the purity of the church, we get, destructive, uh, we get destructive in our protection, but we don't destroy people. We're not a religion that makes progress by killing people. I know that there have been false churches and false Christians throughout history. They claim to be believers who did that sort of thing. You think of the Crusades or, or the Conquistadors or anything like that, but they would be the the same enemy that the Apostle Paul is opposing here. They call themselves Christians, but they're not doing what Christ called us to do. And when you look back at history, those people were no more Christian than the liberal churches today who deny the deity of Christ or the exclusivity of Christ, those who do the exact opposite of Scripture in the name of God, which is exactly what Satan does at the temptation of Christ. We don't kill people. We don't wage war according to the flesh. Instead, we die for people. We, we let goods and kindred go, and this mortal life also, the body they may kill, but his truth abideth still. We, we are meek, weak followers of Jesus who expect to be treated the same way that he was treated, which was suffered, persecuted, killed. That's what we expect. And again, that doesn't mean we're not destructive. We are meek destroyers who destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments. We destroy opinions that set themselves up against God. And again, this isn't talking primarily about outside in the world. This isn't talking about what takes place at your school or in your office or in college campuses or corporate offices, right, to eradicate their thinking. That may be an extension of it, but this is talking about inside the church, These infiltrators had come in and started teaching worldly ways of thinking about God and about the church and about the church's mission. And once they had a foothold, they set up a little stronghold so that their teaching would remain. And it's that stronghold that must be destroyed. There are some things in the Bible that we at the church can disagree on. And we're still believers. We're still the church. Like you think about, is Jesus coming back? Yes, Okay, what's it going to look like when he does? Is there a thousand-year reign? Uh, is there a, a secret rapture, right? We, we can debate those things and still be Christians, still be part of the church together. Or things like speaking in tongues. Is that still around? Well, we can debate that and be on opposite sides and still be Christians, still be in the church. But when it comes to arguments that are against God... What, what we cannot abide are arguments and opinions that are raised against the knowledge of God. And in this context, Paul is talking about things in the church that teach a different Jesus, a different spirit, and a different gospel. Any attempt to make Jesus 
less like the Bible in order to make him more acceptable to unbelievers is demonic and that attempt must be destroyed. Any teaching that promotes godliness as a way of escaping pain and suffering is directly against God's word, which tells us all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. And so any teaching that says otherwise must be destroyed. Any doctrine or philosophy or sociological wall that is put up against the knowledge of God must be destroyed. And we do that using all the divine power that he has given us. And not only that, but the end of verse 5 says we are to take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now most of the time when I hear that, and probably most of the times I've said that, it's in the um, context of like, uh-oh, a sinful thought came in. You know, oh, I, I feel tempted to lie, or I feel tempted to lust, or I feel tempted to be greedy, right? And I got to take that thought captive, right? And that's true. That is 100% okay and, and good and right. But that's an application of this verse, not the primary meaning. Remember, Paul is using this warfare imagery here. And so army comes up to a stronghold, and what do they do? They start attacking it, start attacking it. And once they gain control over the stronghold, what do they do with the people inside? They take them captive. So a stronghold gets set up in the church. Arguments and opinions that are against God and his word, those get destroyed, and any remaining thoughts must be captured and taken to obey Christ. What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, it's helpful to see that this isn't the end of the sentence. You get to the end of verse 5, there's not a period there. In fact, really, verses 3 through 6 are all one sentence in the Greek. Um, But I'm going to start reading in verse 5, and I want to make sure to go to the end so we can catch the the context. So verse 5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. This is a good reminder that while Paul was teaching all Christians, it was originally given in a specific context of what was happening in the Corinthian church. And we've already seen that he expected the church to deal with these false teachers before he got there. He wants them to obey Christ and silence any teachers or groups or people who would set themselves up against God. When that obedience is complete, then they would go about and punish every disobedience. How? By the use of church discipline. Again, we don't destroy people. We destroy false teachings and opinions. And we do that by silencing them. People who come in with a worldly way of thinking, they don't get a say for how the church runs and what happens in the church. They don't get a vote. They don't get a platform. They don't get a time to share. And if they continue to spout off false teachings, they go through the process of church discipline, which ends with the unrepentant being excommunicated and put out of the church. You cannot be the body of Christ when you allow tumors to grow or entertain suicidal thoughts because both will kill the body. And that's what these false teachings are. They are cancers and suicidal thoughts. And if the church does not fight for the purity of its identity and its mission, then it will no longer be the church and we will die. Probably a fantastically popular and wealthy in a world that cares nothing for the gospel. That's how churches die. I mean, I know we hear about, oh, churches are closing every day and they're, they're dying because they won't let go of old ways, but that's not the most often way pe- churches die. The most often way that they die is they give into a worldly way of thinking and they become wildly successful. Thousands and thousands of people coming and they never give the word And they give a version of Jesus that makes them feel good. A version of the gospel that will make them more successful in life. And they slowly lose the identity of Christ. It's a fantastic death. We are in the ministry of war. And it's a holy war for the body of Christ. And so therefore, we are to be on alert, looking for opposition, not to us, 
It's not to the leadership, opposition to the leadership. It's not opposition to, um, it's opposition to Christ in his word. And we look for worldly ways of thinking that come in and set themselves up and we silence them. And so you're in bridge group, someone brings in worldly thinking. You don't, you don't turn on the verbal bazookas right away, right? You, you correct, right? Say, no, here's what scripture says. But if they continue trying to get a stronghold, well, I know scripture says this, but here's what I think, or here's what statistics show. You silence it. Because we will either be people who stand on the word of God by the Holy Spirit, using the power that comes from both to advance God's kingdom, or we will die and we'll end up looking just like the rest of the world. So we're called to fight. We're called to be destructive. And so let's fight with all of heaven to keep the church pure. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you that you have not left us here so we can simply be entertained on our way to eternity. But you've given us your word and you've given us your spirit so that we can keep the identity of Christ preeminent. I pray that you would help us maintain the purity of your church. Help us be meek. Help us be lowly. Help us be servants. Help us have servant attitudes. And I pray that you would make us bold. Bold to not give up one centimeter in the church of, uh, to worldly thinking. I pray that you give us wisdom and help us embrace the divine power that you have for us. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.